what got me into it, I guess, was my brother teaching me how to play three or four songs on the guitar. And then six months later, the Dillards, seeing them at the Tustin Paradox Club, it was called. And uh, that just took me off. I came home and I took the fifth string off my guitar and put a nail in at the fifth fret to make it short. And because uh, <laughs> I wanted a short string, but then I didn't know how to tune it. And I had to go back and ask them the next night. I ended up watching the Dillards an average of two to three nights a week for about two years. And Rodney Dillard's become a really good friend over the years. And uh, in fact, I made a documentary on the Dillard's called A Night in the Ozarks. It's just been released recently. Captures with four cameras, shot with live sound, them playing in a farmhouse in Missouri. And uh, as I listened to them and listened to the radio and the dirt band came along, I wanted to be able to get an instrument like the banjo on the radio. Boy, there's a challenge because I was going to college just before the Dirt Band, my last year of college, which was right after my first year, um, and a song came on the radio. Oh, that one. It was the birds doing Tambourine Man, and I knew Chris Hillman was a mandolin player from a bluegrass band in San Diego, and he's on the radio. Well, if he can get on the radio, so can a banjo player. I didn't play the banjo yet. I mean, I didn't play the mandolin yet, and uh, or the fiddle. I was just living in Orange County being a banjo player, kind of like growing up behind the Orange Curtain. And I'll never forget, as I got to playing, I went and did a session. I, I don't know, I started playing. And I was told I was pretty good, but there weren't very many people to compare to. He's the best banjo player in the band. Well, he's the only one. Okay. I did a session for, um, it was Rocky Raccoon was a session, and it was Richie Havens, my first recording session. I'm back there playing banjo behind Richie Havens. And then I did one for Mike Post doing Louisiana Man. I never knew then what a Doug Kershaw was, but um, Doug became a friend over the years. Basically, what I wanted to do was get the banjo and then the mandolin on the radio and then make some old records. That's what we're all trying to do is just make old records. Hey, I remember this one. Remember this one? That kind of thing. Maybe Carolina in the Pines is one of those, that Mike, Michael Murphy song that's got I played the banjo on. And uh, the Dirt Band's Bojangles, though, was a very proud achievement. Not, not, I don't know though it's like it was the third song I learned on the mandolin I've never let that cat out of the bag but uh, fortunately I got through it and I didn't know the dog died for about five years I thought his dog's name was Up and Died his dog Up and Died uh, here Up and Died here boy I found that I listened to the sounds of the chords and the way the lyrics affect the words <laughs> the way the lyrics affect the, the the melody and the chord changes and I like to play behind those and that became my next love of backing up people that were singing trying to find musical sounds not necessarily hot licks uh, but just sounds that would fit and that led me to film scoring, which is one of my current pursuits, besides playing solo. I'd, I'd like to invite you to check out my website. My mother thought of the website name. It's John McEwen, and pretty clever yeah, for her. I added .com. But it's got some of these stories and stories about some of the film scores that I've worked on, and I'm still in pursuit of them. So if you've got one, let me know. So the pursuit was basically get out there, meet people, see the world. Played over 6,000 shows, flown 3 million miles. I'm not sure I'm proud of that. It's a pretty stupid way to go to work. Oh, I got a job. It's 8,000 miles away, and they're going to hire me for one hour. Oh, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But it makes a few dollars. And uh, been playing over the years with some interesting people. Um, I'll never forget some of them, like... Who was that I was trying to think of? No, like Bill Wyman being called into a Bill Wyman session by my friend Leon Russell. 
and having to play a classical banjo tune for the first time. John, this is Bill Wyman. Play that Opus 36 for him. Oh, uh, well, uh, okay. And uh, it's just been, a, it's a good run so far. I'm just getting started. I'd say some of my favorite musicians that I've encountered over the years are often people that play the lyrics equally well, and Willie Nelson is hard to beat. He's one of the best, he's the best guitar player to play behind Willie Nelson music, I think. But almost anybody, he's such a great player. I love people like David Grisman and wish I had the hands uh, ability that Bela Fleck has, but I like what I do. Uh, but the musicians I like are people like, well, Byron Berline on fiddle, and Vassar was a, a great inspiration both as a person and a musician. Vassar Clements never had a bad word for anyone, or a bad word. He'd say, Dad, Bime, B-I-M-E, and I'm looking for somebody else that knows that word, and I haven't found him yet. And it works for anything. That Dad, Bime, fiddle's out of tune. Well, that Dad, Bime, flight is late. And the... Uh, Vassar, you want some pie? Dead by him. Works anywhere. Earl Scruggs, Maybell Carter was great to know. I feel proud that that uh, I was able to give Maybell her first gold record. Um, Marty Stewart, I called him up and said, I don't want to go alone. The Dirt Band Circle Be Unbroken album. Well, somebody had to give it to her, so I took it out to her. This is Maybell Carter. And... Uh, <clears throat> She didn't know what she did, in a good way. Maybell, here's a gold record that's 500,000 people bought this album. Well, I didn't know that many people even heard those old songs. Would you like some lemonade? Come on in, boy, sit down. You know, she was just an angel. The album did a million, well over a million units later on. But, but uh, working with Johnny Cash was really fun, and but being around them was even more fun, seeing a couple of people that were uh, living their life the way they did. Generally, it's the ones that uh, are, are strange are the times that one didn't go up to somebody and say, you're an idiot or you're wrong. And what I mean by that is I'm proud of playing on the Marshall Tucker's Long Hard Ride album, and it won a Grammy, and, and I played mandolin and banjo on it, and it was a lot of fun. I wish I'd had the nerve to uh, tell a bunch of guys that I ran into there that uh, they shouldn't be doing cocaine, and it it ruined their lives. It was uh, basically the people that you run into that leave strange impressions, you know? They sometimes leave a, an impression like that, and you wish you would have said something, but it wasn't my place. He sure could play the heck out of that guitar, though. Um, Dolly Parton. Do it the way she does. She's just she's just like what you see, you know? Costs a lot of money to look this cheap. Uh, she's Miss, Miss Nice Lady, and she works really hard. Great songwriter. Porter Wagner, what a fine guy he is. You know, Porter is just... He could be up for 35 hours and head into his bus and he said, Porter, would you take a picture with me? Oh, sure, where are they right here? Let me sign that for you. This guy doesn't need that, but he needs them. The first time we went to Denver, well, in the first 10 years of the Dirt Band, I was also road managing. I hadn't learned the word delegate yet. And we had one roadie, and I would drive the equipment and meet the band in the town at the airport. And that was good. I liked the experience. But here I am in a rider truck with my roadie, a 17-foot, 18-foot rider, box truck. And we had to get from New Jersey to Denver. We had two days to do it two and a half actually but I knew we could do it in 42 hours and uh, but around hour nine I'd picked up a hitchhiker and put Gary in back because he needed to sleep and I'm, I'm going down the road and I look talking to the hitchhiker I look at the at the temperature gauge and gee there should be a, a needle there somewhere and I look oh there's the needle it's way down past that H well maybe I'd better pull over I pull over in a rest area and sure enough steam is pouring out pouring out from under the hood of this truck. I let the steam clear, I raised the hood, and I realized, well, there's some big metal thing in here with a bunch of belts on it had broken off. Hey, please, I'm 20 
one or two years old, all right? Fresh out of Orange County and still... Uh. So I take that big metal thing, which I later find out is the alternator, and I put it back where I could see that it had broken from a mount, and I got a bunch of coat hangers and tied it in together and mounted it up, ready to go. Everything's in position. Maybe I'd better get some advice. Oh, there's a trucker over there. Keep in mind, it's 1970, okay? And I go over to this trucker, one of those guys with a short white T-shirt with the cigarettes, you know, camels, of course, rolled up in his sleeve, cowboy boots, his hair's really long, about like that. Uh, pardon me, sir, but uh, and my hair was long then. It's, I mean, really long and dark. It's still black inside. And would you come over here and look at this? I had a, a difficulty with my traveling vehicle here, and uh, I wanted to see if I fixed it. And he comes over. He doesn't say a word. He's looking at me like I should be dead is basically it. And he looks in under the hood. He looks at me. He looks under the hood. He looks at me, and he goes, shit, and walks back to his truck. And I'm going, so I guess that means everything's okay. Yeah, uh-huh. So I go, oh, well, it's probably not a good sign. I go ahead and start the truck. The whole thing just rips apart. <laughs> the alternator flies out. The coat hangers are everywhere. I had no idea what torque was then. And uh, other than Peter and the monkeys, I met him when he was washing dishes. And, uh, okay, I, I got the truck changed over to a new truck. I got a thousand miles credit. It took only an hour and 40 minutes for the turnaround. I woke the roadie up and back. I cashed a check with a hitchhiker because I was running out of money. And, uh, got, and <laughs> going down the road, I said to Gary, the roadie, I said, well, at least the mirrors are good. And right then, the driver's mirror falls off. <laughs> and he opens up his window. Well, this one looks, <coughs> it falls off. So we're going into Kansas City with no money and no mirrors, but I made $75 on the check with a hitchhiker. And uh, we finally made it to Denver. Well, here I am after, well, 40-plus years. The Dirt Band's been together for over 40 years. What a shock is that? I've been playing a few years before that, but I remember when I was starting to learn how to play, how difficult it was. Oh, a book. You can't get a lot out of a book. The sound, you can get some ideas. Oh, then along comes some videotapes. Oh, the best place to learn was seeing people live, watching them do something over and over. That's how I learned. That's how so many people learn. And now that iVideotunes has come along and you can get this stuff, stick it on your computer and take it with you and just look at it whenever you want, it's like, oh my gosh, are these people going to be good in a few years? <laughs> it's a good thing. I would say that um, with the variety of stuff that's available, you go check it out. It can get you ahead so much further. I mean, I found even with with the people that I was fortunate to hang around that, that well, I remember when I had Earl Scruggs first show, Earl, I'm playing Sally Good, and then I'm moving my fingers around, and I had, Earl, would you play it for me? And he puts his fingers on the neck, and they don't hardly move. And because he, I says, well, you know, I do it different. He goes, well, I just wouldn't want to jump around that much. <laughs> you know, you don't get that out of a book sometimes. You don't get that off of a record. And you sometimes don't even get it watching some people play live. So if you go to iVideotunes and you see people that have helped create some of the music that you've fallen in love with and see how they did it, you'll get to their space faster. Some people say, what are you doing nowadays? I just want to make sure you know that this year the Wild West album came out. It's a... Uh, soundtrack from a miniseries I scored has a lot of great people on it also the Sesame Street DVD I'm doing Oh Susanna with 50 goats and a cow that's a lot of fun the cow is really fun um, let's see I've got Vanguard albums that might interest you check them out on my website my mother thought of the name John McEwen hey I've heard that before um, just finished scoring a film called Maynard Dixon Art and Spirit about the great American painter Maynard Dixon and especially check out the documentary that came out last year I produced and directed on the Dillards, my true mentors in music and performing life. It's called A Night in the Ozarks on Varese Saraband.
Thanks. I get a lot of questions about where did I get this banjo. And uh, very lucky to get it. It was at Gruen Guitars in Nashville. I walked in in 75, and there it was hanging on the wall. George, how much is that banjo? Well, the banjo, $1,700. And I said, well, would you, can I give you 1600 Well, you can give me the 1600 but I won't give you the banjo. Can I borrow it for a couple hours? Well, okay. So I borrowed it and took it out to Earl Scruggs' house. He wasn't home, but his banjo and his wife Louise were. Louise, would you please sit down and turn your back for a few minutes? I got this banjo I want to buy. And so I took Earl's banjo and I went, you know, I went, I went. To... Then I took this banjo and went. Which one's Earl's banjo, Louise? I did this like on a bunch of different tunes, like. You know, just very straight. Every time she thought this one was Earl's banjo. And I went, thank you. I went back and wrote a hot check for it, the 1927 Florentine. But that check should be good pretty soon. <laughs> good sound. I like that sound. I fell in love with that sound around 1963 or 4 when I heard the Dillards in California in Tustin. And Doug Dillard's lightning fast playing got me sucked into music. More than I was. I only knew two songs on the guitar. I started playing the banjo and there was this group playing a club called the Paradox in Orange County, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. They'd done about two shows prior to that, me running into them, and I started sitting in with them. And I'm going to enter a banjo contest in Topanga Canyon. I think this was 65. No, it was 66. It was 1966 in the summer. And I taught the guys this song, Return to Dismal Swamp. It was called Dismal Swamp then. I hadn't returned yet. And uh, named it after a swamp in North Carolina, the first swamp that George Washington um, surveyed. It was his job before he became president. It's nice that a president can have a job prior to being president, unlike some. Anyway, we did Dismal Swamp at this contest, and I won. So I figured, gee, I better hang around this band. It seemed to work for that. And we started learning more tunes, and by August 12 of 1966, around 1.15 in the afternoon, we kind of officially started playing together after that banjo contest. And Dismal Swamp was a song my, my brother was playing guitar. That was written before the Dirt Band. And my brother was supplying the chords and chopping away. And here, years later, I ended up recording it on an album for Vanguard, as well as with the Dirt Band. But I think my favorite recording is on the String Wizards album on Vanguard Records with Jerry Douglas and Sam Bush and Junior Husky and... David Greer and Stuart Duncan. Wow. <laughs> That's the Return to Dismal Swamp story. Hi, this is John McEwen, and I'm here to show you how I play Return to Dismal Swamp 2. This is in a, a G tuning right now, a G major tuning. I came up with that song, I like the sound, the sad sound of the banjo in a minor tuning. What that means is you take the G and you lower the third note of the scale. There's eight notes. You go to the third one. The quick music lesson is a major chord is made up of the first, third, and fifth notes of the scale. So you go to the third and lower it a half step makes a minor chord. Now sometimes it'll put the rest of your instrument a little out of tune. So you have to adjust. The reason that happens is as you change tensions on the string, the tension on the neck changes and it pulls a little harder on the other strings. 
Now the thing that's different about the minor tuning opposed to the major, the simple way to look at it, is in the major tuning, you'll use the second and fourth fret a lot. And then, or maybe up here, you'll use, you use a lot of the even number frets. Well, when you go to the minor tuning and you want to just try and figure out what it sounds like, use the third fret and the fifth fret and the first fret and the open. Instead of the ninth fret, use the eighth because that's the same as that minor note. So let's go back. In other words, let's take it the major tuning. We do that in a minor tuning. We do that in a minor tuning, and you go to the third fret and fifth fret. It's a kind of a minor sound. Now the basic patterns used in Dismal Swamp are a first string lead, pause there so that's in the bridge so it's there's a lot of double thumbing which is three two five one and it's also on the fourth string Sometimes you're going to stay on the third string and not use the fifth, like this. And, and the chords used to execute Dismal Swamp are pretty simple, basic. That's an F chord. Now since that second string is tuned down a half step, you can't play an F chord like in G tuning. You have to raise it up a half step. If you don't, you'll get fired. Now in that D position that I went through on the Toguri Mountain video, the basic D position that is usable around the neck, you can't can't quite play that either. You have to raise the second string up a half fret. I mean a half step. So that's a D chord, but up here that would be D, D sharp, E, F. So here's a G minor, F, G minor, F again. Let's get to the playing of the song. Let's go to the ABC parts of the song, starting with the A part. Two one two one five two one five. When you apply the left hand, and we go to the double thumbing. Back to the back to double thumbing. So it's so it's and that little lick is just that's double thumbing moving the strings you're hitting. It's basically the back and forth. So the 
first part slow. this and the chords are which would be C minor A flat B flat G minor the second time through C minor A flat B flat, C. Now that's a C because it's this position. Again, it's like that F position, but with that one finger moved up. And then that drops down at the end of the B part to the C minor. So here's the B part. that going as it changes to C minor. Like that. Now keep in mind, anytime, almost anytime you got a note to hit, you can hit it a half step flat and slide into it. On this, for example, you can play it simple. slide into each note. Giving a little more, you can slide into any one of them. So you can go. Now this little lick right here is the same as you played here. You can go. Sounds like Foggy Mountain Breakdown in C. That's the B part. The C part chords are basically um, an E flat to C minor. One of the coolest chords in the banjo in G tuning or any tuning, I think is E flat. That's the first and the fourth string on the first fret. All the others are open. Now if you do double thumbing, that's a whole chord. Well the bridge, the C part, goes from C minor between C minor and E flat. It starts on E flat. Da -da 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 -da. And this is your C minor. You just take that E flat and add that C note to it. But in the playing of the lead of the bridge, this is the E flat chord, you don't need the whole chord, so it goes. And this is again that, that that's almost the same lead as As the B part, but you do it here. You slide into it from here. You can add that to it because it's the seventh of that of that minor chord. So the the C part. to go to F, so it's, there's that F from previous mention. The 
whole C part. play the whole performance of Dismal Swamp ABC parts through. There might be a couple of notes different in here from the uh, basic thing I was showing, but it's all based upon the patterns that we've gone through. Before we get into the up-tempo version, the combat speed, let me show you the uh, Turkish kind of lick that goes in, I like to have put in just before the, uh, say, the third or fourth C part. And that goes like this against the C minor chord, using just those two fingers, and getting this F note, it's going to move from here, after the first time I hit it, to here going to end up on that note and what happens is that goes by really quick it comes in right on that and then that lick is well does that ever sound weird by itself but so do I How do you know? Oh, uh, so. And uh, that's fun to put in there. See, not everybody can play it, so that's why I like to do it. Let's do it up to tempo. Let's see if we can do Dismal Swamp up to tempo. 